now. Give the intern control of your botnet and pour yourself an adult beverage, preferably a beer. Because here's your host. He's a few no op short of an exploit and is a man who plays strip elevation of privileges all by himself, Paul Asadorian. <laughs> <coughs> Hello, everyone, and welcome to this edition of Paul.com Security Weekly, episode 277 for February 9th, 2012. Coming to you live in the brand new studio, broadcasting in high depth, of course. Very excited about that. Dave, the AV guy, is here. Got everything set up. And uh, you can, of course, watch this show live. Paul.com.com forward slash live each and every Thursday nights from 6 o'clock to 8 o'clock p.m. Eastern Standard Time. You can get all of our videos on blip.tv. That's blip.tv forward slash Paul.com. And also on YouTube. We just got promoted, I guess, on YouTube. You can have videos, uh, we can have videos longer than 15 minutes. So youtube.com forward slash paul.com, you can find all of our videos, even the ones from way back in the day. Speaking of people that have been here since way back in the day, to my left is of course Mr. Larry Pesci. Welcome, Larry. Oh, who me? Oh. Yes, you. Ooh. Oh. Dave and I were watching some of the uh, videos. I'm sorry. From, uh, <laughs> remember the Airpone video? Oh, God. Yeah, we watched some of those. You know, we were we were critiquing, we were learning we were, stuff. You know, we, we were noobs looking at things. That we, <laughs> you know, at the video I, thing. The video I also thing. was going back at the uh, the previous videos, and we started for like Paul dot TV stuff, like episode like fourteen or fifteen. Like we've been trying to do yeah. the video thing since the start, and we still. Are working on it. Although we've come, <laughs> we've come a long way. We're from, still, we're still. Hey, 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 I was gonna say, man, yeah, some we, of us have put we, a lot of work in this. Over we the have, past we have, yeah, we so. come, we've come a long way. Uh, Mr. Jack Daniel is here. Speaking Where? of people from long, far away. The Thank Cape Cod is far from yeah, here, yeah, from yeah, Rhode so Island. I, thought, I, mean, I thought it was an old joke. Yeah, going, I thought it was an old joke. You too. thought I was going with the old joke, yeah, didn't you? See, yeah, yeah. <laughs> don't worry, those are coming. <laughs> those are coming. Yeah, right. So how you doing That's tonight, what Jack? <laughs> Out, outstanding. Outstanding. Excellent. <laughs> Mr. John Strand is here from South Hello, Dakota. Hello, everybody. Broadcasting from his car from the parking lot in an undisclosed location. Do you have pants and on, John? Yeah, you know what? Don't well, answer that. Never mind. I don't want to know. Yes, there we go. It's every bit as creepy as it sounds, folks. <laughs> wow, he's at a rest area. <laughs> <laughs> Don't be afraid to get close to the microphone, John. See, you like how I reversed that, huh? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, nice, nice. Oh, boy. Uh, John Strait, should we, what do we want to do with uh, CCDC, John? Do we want to announce well, that? Do we want to skip it? What do you want to do? Right, let's let's skip it. Let's skip it for today. But let's let people know that at CCDC, both Paul and myself and Larry, I think you're going to be there too, right? Yes, I You'll am. You'll be doing the badges. Yep. Somehow, I don't know how Paul got this to work, Larry, but I don't have to actually do anything but talk. It sounds like you have actual work, work to do. To do. At yeah, well, and talk. We just show up and talk. Yeah, you always get volunteered yep. to talk and do. Yeah, which other is stuff. which is cool. Which is yeah. cool. It's fine. It's for the kids. That's because 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 Larry's the only one that actually does any work around here. Wow. Yes. Oh. Okay. <laughs> Mid Atlantic State CCDC. Uh, uh, Paul, what are the dates on that? When are we going to be up? Uh, 13th through the 17th. Yes, thank you. There's all kinds of stuff going the, uh, on that week. And then the other interesting thing is we'll be bringing offensive countermeasures to Sands Orlando. Yes. Uh, so be sure to check that out in the show notes. <laughs> and in, in is, it con- is it confirmed to be at that conference in the summer? Uh, not quite yet. I've okay. seen it on the preliminary stuff that Sands puts out, so I know that it's coming up. What about the um, other conference coming- in the summer? It'll be coming up at other SANS conferences, so be on the lookout for offensive countermeasures. Hey, what about that, that conference in Vegas every year? Oh, the uh, uh, black something. Yeah. Uh, Is it confer- black hat. Yes. Can we talk about that yep. yet? Black helicopter. Uh, yeah, actually, I'll be putting that up on the show notes too, but yeah, we will be running at Black Hat. We sold out both sessions. Um, it was very well received, and they invited us back. Why, we really don't know. But uh, And I think, Paul, you're going to be co-teaching it this year with me, yes. so we're both going to be That's the there. plan. That's the plan. There will be no confusion about where Paul.com is going to be. We're going to be at right. the Office of County Measures class at Black Hat. That is correct. Nice. Both with your pants off. Absolutely. Both with our pants off at some point. See, the, that's the difference between Sands and Black Hat. Sands actually has it in our contract that we have to wear pants. Black Hat says it's optional. Something about if you want to embarrass yourselves, get on with it. Yeah. Nice. 
Uh, Larry Seaching, Security 617 Wireless, ethical hacking, penetration testing, and defense five times this year. You can catch him everywhere. in yeah. Baltimore, Toronto A, Ottawa A, Sydney. And v, and v Live, and allegedly also and one v in New York Live. City, too. In New York City. At Pace University. <clears throat> and be New York certain, City? New York City. Get a room. Be certain to check out our new show, is Hack Naked TV with John Strand, Hack Naked at Night with Larry and Darren, and Paul.com Espanol with none other than Carlos Perez. And of course, subscribe to our only non-computer security-related show for cigar enthusiasts, and that's the Stoke Geeks with myself. Jack is holding up the Stoke Geeks stickers that we just produced, so if you'd like a Stoke Geeks sticker... You just have to come find me somewhere, and I yeah. will give you some. <laughs> I was going to say, sorry about your luck. Um, so that's, of course, with myself and Tim the Bugbear Muggerini. <clears throat> Excuse me. Sorry. Can we edit that out? Uh, that's all you do. No edits. No, no edits. edits. <laughs> no edits. You get to do the video, so no edits. That's right. Actually, Dave's doing the video now, mm. so be kind to Dave on the video so he has less editing to do. Every, every eighth frame he's going to put in... Man That's right. <laughs> it's going to put in some interesting stuff. So, uh, speaking of interesting stuff, we're going to take a very short break and come back with our guest for this episode. Um, as soon as I figure out how to use my soundboard that I've been using for about 100 episodes. Okay, let's try that again. Cut to break. <laughs> We are all very pleased to welcome Adam Shostak to the show, a principal program manager on the Microsoft Usable Security Team in Trustworthy Computing, which performs ongoing research into classifying and quantifying how window machine, Windows machines get compromised. Before joining Microsoft, Adam helped found the CVE, the Privacy Enhancing Technologies Symposium in International Financial Cryptography Association. He's also <laughs> the co-author of the new book, The New School of Information Security. Adam writes at the Emerging Chaos blog and, of course, the New School of Information Security blog. Welcome, Adam, to the show. Hey, happy to be here. So, Adam, <clears throat> how did you get your start in information security? How did I get my start in information security? Um, I actually started my career in computers as a sysadmin. Uh, you guys in the in the pre-show were talking about Solaris. Yeah, I was going to ask you, is it Solaris? Because uh, someone had some questions that you can point them your way. <laughs> uh, actually, it, it was SunOS. I remember uh, okay, the SunOS yes. to Solaris transition. I do too. Uh, rough times, rough times. It, you know, it kept the employed. BSD System 5 war is very exciting, but <clears throat> discovered that the thing that I really loved about the sysadmin job, I was working at a hospital. And so I ended up with a lot of security and privacy sort of things on my plate and sort of went from there, became a consultant for a little while, left consulting to join a startup, another startup, another startup, and yeah, things, things keep rolling, rolling like that. Very cool. So Adam, has anyone ever mistaken you for Weird Al Yankovic? <laughs> <laughs> so before only the show, on, Dave, the AV guy, here, Dave, yes. Dave the AV guy is going, you know, Adam kind of looks like Weird Al Yankovic. <laughs> <laughs> that was completely unplanned. I had heard that. Uh, only on my very worst hair days. Oh, <laughs> there sorry. you go. So can you briefly describe the idea of the new school to us? <laughs> Sure. The, the New School is, is a book that Andrew, Andrew Stewart and I wrote. And the key, the, I think the two ideas that, that are key are, number one, we've got to get focused on talking about what goes wrong. We have to look at outcomes. We have to understand what led to those bad outcomes. We have to learn from each other's mistakes so that we can be empirical about what we're doing. And the second big idea is that it's not all about crypto. It's not all about the technology. It's about how the technology plays into systems, which is why I'm actually so excited to be working in usable security now <laughs> is the people matter. The, you, you have to understand that if Johnny can't encrypt, Johnny can't encrypt, and it doesn't matter if you give him a 2048-bit RSA key or a 40-bit RC4 key or like a 6-bit whatever key, um, you need to make sure that he knows how to use the thing. Um, and so we need to, we need to 
understand the people end of it. We need to think about security in terms of psychology, in terms of sociology, in terms of economics, and really learn from other fields as a way to get a better handle on our problem. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> so, so that's the book in a nutshell. Oh, excellent, go ahead. Excellent. Um, so the New School of Information Security has been out for almost four years. What are the most encouraging changes you've seen in that time? Most encouraging change, I think, is probably the the increase in data that we're we're getting and we're we're able to see. Um, you know, five years ago there was no um, DBIR from Verizon. Um, I just haven't had a chance to read it yet. It's been a busy week, but I see that Trustier has a report on what they're seeing with their customers. Um, Dan Kaminsky came up with the idea of an award for the uh, the best data that comes out. And so I think that the idea of data and the availability of data have have really exploded over the last four years or so. And I'd, I'd like to think that we played a little part in uh, in making that happen and drawing people's attention to the gap there. Let, let me take the, uh, the the counter to that because that's my nature. So what the what the, <laughs> so that's the good so, stuff, and it is cool. And, I, and like you um, in in our show notes for uh, later, I've got a link to that uh, trusted um, report. Um, what uh, has been the let's say put it politely the most frustrating or the uh, the least progress of what you had hoped we might uh, have accomplished in the past four years? Can I just jump back to my previous answer and say okay. I hope we've gone further? Okay. Uh, no, but I'll, I'll, I'll give you a, a slightly longer answer, which is I, I actually think that people have picked up on the idea of data and empiricism and the scientific method and all that stuff really well. Um, I don't think there's been as much pickup in the idea of we need to look to other fields. We need to understand why what we're doing isn't working. Um, we need to get beyond... We need to move out of an echo chamber a little bit, and I think a lot of that is welcoming people with different perspectives, different backgrounds, and I don't think that's been picked up on nearly as much as I would like to see. Yeah, I'd love to be able to argue with you, but you're, uh, I'm, I'm with you there. It is, <laughs> well, you can it argue. Is, you just, is, uh, uh, well, yeah, speaking, it, speaking of, you know, argument. speaking of branching out into other areas, um, uh, the title chapter uh, of five is a quote from Alan Schiffman. It says, amateurs study cryptography, professional study economics. Um, mm-hmm. Now, I'm wondering if you can kind of explain that quote and maybe talk about some people that may have taken, taken exception to that quote. Um, so, so the, the essence of the quote, um, it's a, it's a riff on, uh, something Napoleon said, which is that amateur study tactics and professional study logistics. And the idea is that as important as tactics were to Napoleon, the, the thing that made him able to succeed was the ability to field a really big army across really large distances by managing to feed them. Because if you don't feed your army, you don't have much of an army anymore. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I think, you know, by analogy, we're not saying cryptography is unimportant, but cryptography isn't actually going to solve your problems for you, except for some certain very narrow problems. No one's ever really come up to me and argued against that point. Um, I suppose there are people out there who grumble, um, but no one's ever come up to me and said, what the heck do you mean? Uh." Hmm. Uh, um, Adam, this whole concept of you know having to understand mm-hmm. and having the, the professional study economics, so to speak, and, and learning from other other business units is is really you know sort of one of the things that I found uh, coming out of healthcare was sort of being asked as, of me as sort of the the go to guy in the organization for security and DR was uh, the management and all the other folks spoke those languages spoke 
economics. They spoke, you know, charts and graphs. Um, mm -hmm. The problem is, is that they wanted a graph that said, how secure are we? And, and I think that's really sort of one of those challenges, understanding what metrics we can use to evaluate that. Yeah. <clears throat> You you want me to riff on that? Sure. Or, oh yeah. Um, <laughs> sure. Uh, I I think that the question of how secure are we is is one of those that we're we're going to run into forever because it's a it's a natural question for someone outside the field. You know, inside the field, I think we all understand why it is that's hard, and I think that the way to to effectively deal with that is to draw the conversation where you want it to be, to be able to talk about, you know, here's a, here's a set of breaches that have happened in the last year, and here's how we're doing against these things, right? And that's, that's getting to the underlying question that, this, that a manager is trying to ask about what is it that I should be worried about? Are we worrying about the right things? Are we putting our budget into the right places? And I think when you can answer those questions, management will walk away pretty satisfied and they'll be able to dig into the, you know, there's a whole slew of questions that I would ask me about what I just said, you know, <laughs> is one year enough? Is this our, is this the right mix of industries? What about the unexpected threat? Should we have five or 10% of our budget um, in disaster recovery or high impact, low probability sorts of things? All of which are perfectly reasonable questions, and I'm just sort of waving my hands here and saying, bitch, do, 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 here's what you say. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but so, but Adam, really, if you... Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Why don't you weigh in on user education? I mean, is it, is it something that we should focus some of our resources on? How much resources should be focused on it? Should we throw it out the window and forget about it completely? Is it a, is it a dead horse? So, so let me a answer that in two parts. Um, part one is I would love to study that question. I would love to know of the entities that got breached last year, what fraction, what fraction of their security budget or what um, investment per capita did they make on security training? And were they at the high, medium, or low end of their industry? You know, maybe it makes a really big difference. Maybe all of the people who were breached were at the low end of their industry. Maybe it's all over the map. Um, I would love to know, and I don't think we do know. And so that raises for me a really big question of, okay, so you're, you're going to make, you're going to suggest that we spend this money. You're going to suggest that you can't spend, you shouldn't spend this money that uh, people are stupid and we can't educate them. I don't believe that's true for an instant um, because I've actually created educational tools. Hey, look at this, this elevation of privilege. This is all about educating people to threat model better. Um, and what elevation of privilege is? Can I talk about this for a sec? Absolutely. Yeah. Cool. So elevation of privilege is a deck of cards. Here, let me hold up a deck of cards in front of the camera and pick try not to drop card. them all. Nice. Yeah, so here, we'll pick a are card, those, any are card. Are Microsoft playing cards? Yeah. These are. These no are way. Um, oh, I so Creative awesome. Commons licensed by Microsoft. Uh, uh, um, it's we we encourage people I to pick the these up. I was going to bring them. I uh, wasn't I wasn't kidding when I said I was going to bring a set for make for strip. Oh, you were strip talking about cards. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. so this card, which I'm holding in front of my face because it's better looking than I am, is the sixth <laughs> of information disclosure. Um, and it says an attacker can read data because it's hidden or occluded for undo or change management, and the user might forget it's there. So what do you do with this? Um, what you can do is you get people to draw a system that they're concerned about, that they want a threat model on the whiteboard. Developers understand drawing pictures on whiteboards. Do they understand threat modeling? Probably not if they're not security experts. So you deal out these cards, you say, okay, you play a card. And because the cards have hints on them, they're specific, they're focused, um, 
you give people a way to pick them up, to explore a little bit, and to learn. And I think that we can apply that to security education. I think that if security education is more than, hey, bad things might happen, or someone might call you on the phone and ask for information they shouldn't be asking for, say no. Well, that's, that's I mean... People call me on the phone and ask me for information all the time, and they send me email and ask me for information. I have to be able to distinguish between the good ones and the bad ones. Our education has to um, has to focus in on what's a good request, what's a bad request, and the structure that we put into Elevation of Privilege is based on stride. Stride is spoofing. Hey, here's a spoofing card. It's tampering. Here's the king of tampering. It's another card. Um, stride is spoofing, tampering, repudiation, info disclosure, denial of service, and elevation of privilege. So there's a little structure that people who are learning about threat modeling by playing the game can take away, and it's an implicit learning. Um, so I think if we get creative, and I'll wrap up with this, if we get creative, if we focus on understanding is this an effective thing, um, yeah, we can absolutely educate people. So, Adam, before you, you talked about some of the uh, reports from Verizon, Mandiant, uh, Trustwave, and they're all in different formats, and I find they kind of, they spin the data slightly differently. So, mm -hmm. wh what can we do to make the most of these reports? I mean, other than, like, read them, but what are some of, like, your guidelines for reading some of these reports? What are my guidelines for reading these reports? Um... Ooh. Is it drink heavily while you read them? Is that, is that like number one? Do a bunch, um, do a bunch of coke. <laughs> <laughs> then do some yoga. <laughs> yeah. um, so the first thing I look at when, when I pick up one of these reports is I look for the raw numbers. The more numbers a report has, the happier I personally am. Thank you. And for each of those numbers, I try and really understand where did this number come from? Right. What does this mean? If the, if the report is saying, you know, hacktivism is on the rise or mobile malware is on the rise. You know, I saw I, I'm going to misquote this. I'm not I don't remember exactly where mobile malware up 400 percent. Ooh, scary. Well, was that from two to eight or was that from 200,000 incidents to 800,000? What's the population that you're looking at? How do you know that it's gone from gone up by that much? Um, how does that compare to the overall growth? You know, uh, mobile devices are exploding as a category. There's a lot more of them than there were last year. What's the per capita number? And so I try and understand the numbers. Both how the numbers are created, what the what the universe that they're measuring is, and then understand what the context those numbers are happening in. And then, you know, to, to the thing that you said about everyone tries to spin the data, I think everyone's trying to tell a story of some form, and I think that different folks do a different level of telling a story to make it interesting versus telling a story to try and sell you the product. So at the end of reading one of these, I say, what exactly are these guys trying to sell? Mm. Um, and uh, Do you find they, they spin the... I mean, I'm not saying they make up the numbers, but do they present the numbers in a specific way that helps achieve their goals, whatever they may be, or... Um, you know, helps kind of highlight certain things rather than others. Because I find people like well, to play I mean, with numbers. I, I sure expect that people are going to try and present the numbers that help something that they're doing. You know, at some at some level, we work for companies that are trying to deliver some product or service, and these things. You know, I'm part of producing Microsofts, and our our big goal is really to share the data that we've acquired with our customers to help them make decisions. Um, you know, to the, to the extent that we do that well, I'm happy. To the extent that the numbers don't help drive great decisions, I'm, I'm less happy. Um, so I, don't, I think that it's... I, I want to take your question and move it 10 feet over to the left and say, 
Is it unfair distortion or confusing distortion, both of which really get me riled up? Um, and I mean, if you go, if you look at some of the blog posts that I've written, I'll look at some of these reports um, and say, I don't think these numbers add up, and here's why. And I want to offer kudos to the the Poneman Institute, whose numbers used to cause me real concern. And Patrick Fleur did a blog post where he pointed out that they were now including raw data in their appendices. That's awesome. That's, That's really cool. Good for is, them. That is cool. Um, and, and I think, um, not, yeah, I, I've had some of the same concerns you have uh, with some of their conclusions and methodologies. And, and I have found myself kind of chanting, you know, show me the data. And, yep. um, it's and Verizon has actually re done that in response um, when I've when I've blo looked at their report and said, you know, I have this question here. Yep. I, you know, how do these things add up? Uh, Wade Baker was kind enough to go in, query their database, and blog the answer. And and so I think to go to go back to your question, the what do we do to help make them better? Be a critical reader. Be be it ask ask questions. Um, call out the places where these things are unclear. And, and again, let me draw a little bit on my experience. Um, Microsoft's report is well over 100 pages now. It goes through a tremendous number of reviews. One of the primary goals of those reviews is clarity, is do I understand this? Can I, can I make sense of this? And my colleagues have generally been really good, even when I've thrown questions at them at the unfortunate last minute. Hi, you know who you are, and I appreciate your uh, forbearance. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, any project of that size is going to have issues and questions that people have. And I think that we as readers, one of the best things we can do is to engage and say, you know, liked this part, this part, very confusing. This part, you know, the, um, if someone's being self-serving, let's, let's call them out a little bit and say, you know, does your data really say that? Is that the only possible interpretation? So, so I think there's a lot we can do as, as readers of these reports to help keep the quality up and help drive the quality of future ones up further. So Adam, kind of circling back around to your book, um, you know, one of the interesting human elements is that uh, you state that the visible security measures appear to make people less cautious. That is, um, people who believe that maybe the firewall or antivirus uh, is there to protect them, so therefore they don't have to take any personal responsibility for their actions. Can you kind of comment on that and help us try to overcome that social notion? Um, so I'm not sure we, we directly said exactly that, but I think it's a very human situation. There's a, there's a fellow who studies risk by the name, oh, I'm blanking on the name, of course. There's a fellow who came up with the idea of risk homeostasis, and that is that we're willing to accept a certain amount of risk. And so things that take risk out of our, out of our experience do so in a way that causes people to say, oh, well, this is safe. I can do more of it. I can, I, whatever it is. And I think there's an interesting balance of being sufficiently there that people know that security is there to help them, of being unobtrusive and of not being creepy. You know, you don't want to have the secret police. You don't want to have, oops, the attachment just disappears from the email without any notice because there's a virus in it. We don't want people to not be concerned so we don't even put a note in. Well, then I'm sending email back and forth saying, hey, you forgot the attachment, hardy har. No, I didn't. I sent the attachment three times now. What the heck is wrong with you? Uh, and so I, th I think the, the key is to really understand what your user base is, what, your ex what their expectations are, and how, 
how to how to communicate with them about risk. It's it's not a short, quick thing. It's a it's an incredibly complex thing. Um. So you wrote a blog post that talked about some research from Salter and Schroeder. I think I'm saying that correctly. And there, <laughs> yep. There are eight principles and why the paper was written in 1974 still makes a whole lot of sense today. I thought yes. everyone in the 70s was just on drugs and then Well, they anything. were. And they just Well, maybe that's why they, they make had, sense. They had yeah. epiphany. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this is where everybody looks at me again. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. When we talk about the 50s and 60s, that's when we look at you, Jack. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Did I say that out loud? <laughs> so now that we've completely derailed it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. So, Adam, tell us about Salter and Schroeder. Oh, okay. Um, let's see. So, Salter and Schroeder were... Um, wrote this paper on... Oh, is it? I believe it's security principles for secure software design. Um, and I called it the most quoted and least read paper in the history of computer security um, because they have a whole bunch of design principles, which I think were were interesting, were well thought through for the time. I think in computer security we have a we have a problem of not really learning about our history. But anyway, they wrote about the, these eight principles, and I've actually I've still never read their paper end to end. I'll I'll own up to that because I think it's funny given given what I did, which is I um, decided to illustrate them up with scenes from Star Wars to make them a little more effective, <laughs> a, a little more accessible and effective. That's, it's pretty good. It's pretty good. Um, can can we can we pop some into the video just so people can get a sense of what that is? Yes. Yes, we can. Um, and do you want to just tell oh, me which one you're going to... Oh, I see there's pictures. Okay. Yeah, there's... There, see, you didn't even read the blog post I, that talks I, about I, I the I read the first two reacted. paragraphs, and then I, <laughs> I didn't scroll. See, I was, I, was the one, uh, I was the one that put that question in the... See, the someone... Weekend. I knew someone read it if it was in the show notes. Because it had Star Wars in it, duh. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> what is it called? Uh, it's linked to in the... Uh, if you go to Emergent right. Chaos, it's right up there in the header, um, next to Home and About. Um, Dave, you're not able to switch to my screen, are you? You didn't no, set no. that up, did you? That's too bad. No. So so uh, let's look at the one well, for fail-safe defaults. Um, fail-safe defaults is one of their principles, gotcha. along with economy of mechanism and complete mediation. And I decided to use the scene where... Um, Luke and, Luke and Han are dressed up as stormtroopers and they're taking Chewie into the detention center. And the, uh, the guard is arguing with them and eventually they, they end up opening fire. And once they've opened fire, they can't get into the detention center because it's all locked down. And that's a great example of a fail-safe default where... Had they decided to put the safety and well-being of their prisoners at the top of the list, then when there was a fire, the doors would all have opened and the prisoners could get out instead of suffocating in the smoke or what have you. But it's the Empire, so they used fail-safe defaults. <laughs> and, and so I think this is another example of education, you know, trying to... Uh, make it fun by by drawing on something entertaining, a shared experience we have. And as you can see, people still don't pay any attention. <laughs> Every, everything's fine here. Um, how are you? Uh, yes, just exactly. A, just, just a small relac reactor leak. We're that conversation was, we'll we'll that send some men down there to anyway. help you out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That conversation is going nowhere anyways. <laughs> <laughs> it's always good to be on a podcast where we can run the movie without the movie. Yeah, that's, right. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Jack, did you have more questions for Adam? Uh, I've got all sorts of them, but we can... Good. Go there. Well, I mean, we can ramble on for hours um, because uh, I'm an I'm a Adam Showstock fanboy. Um, <laughs> oh, well, don't say that. <laughs> now, it, now, see, now it comes out. Well, yep. it's, um, so you're on, Jack. I do have another question when Actually, Jack is done. 
Let's, let's I'm just going to sit here and drink beer. Okay, yeah, you yeah, sit there and drink beer. Let's let Larry dive into the <laughs> into the fray. So, Adam, I was uh, we were talking about this pre-show. I was going to uh, talk about uh, this during sort of our news segments, uh, which was a, a blog post that you put up on why breach disclosure is expensive. Um, and, and I sort of wanted to go down the path and see what your thoughts on this were and get your comments. Who better to get it from the man that wrote the blog posting himself? And my sort of take on that was, will this discourage uh, companies from reporting breaches because it's so expensive, uh, even at the expense of fines and legal actions? Because the fines and legal actions may end up being cheaper than uh, reporting the disclosure. You know, I hope not and expect so. <laughs> um, there, there's. This is one of those things that's really hard to gather data on, but a lot of people who are in a position to know, and I, I hate this sort of thing. I mean, I, I started talking about data. We were doing so well, and now here I am quoting unnamed sources with random thoughts. Um, but that's what we've got to go on, and that's what I hate, so I'll just do it to, to illustrate a point. How's that? I'm illustrating a point by saying the people who, who go and do breach investigations tell me that an awful lot of their clients are legally obligated to report breaches out to the public, to regulators of various sorts, and they don't do so. Um, and you can take that for what it's worth, which is an unsourced comment based on other people's observations. I, I will sort of corroborate those types of things, Ben, in, in a number of customer sites, and we've heard them say that, um, yeah, we've got policies on, on these types of things, and, and it's been the comment of our management, not to the, 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 the folks that I've been dealing with, that, uh, yeah, sure, we're obligated to do these things, but um, our legal counsel has said, yeah, screw it, we're not going to invest the money because it'll be cheaper for us to, to pay the fines when it happens. Yeah, it happens. <laughs> <laughs> it happens. It's, it, it becomes, it becomes a, an economic problem, not, not yes. a security problem. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, 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 um, so, tell us why breach disclosure is so expensive. Um. So, so I think there's two answers to that. The first answer is because, with with the very best of intentions, um, to help prevent there from being too many notifications that don't mean anything. Um, to save companies the money of sending out all these mailers, et cetera, et cetera, we've started to put in, or various legislators have started to put in what are called these trigger provisions, which, it, which say you have to notify, it used to be, or the very first of these laws said, you have to notify once you've lost control of the data. And then they started saying, well, you only have to notify if there's a significant risk of harm. Well, what, what exactly is a significant risk of harm? Um, we could spend hours arguing about that. If we had lawyers around, we could spend even more hours arguing of about course, it. Bill, we have billable, billable rates. <laughs> a billable rates. And, you know, you and I have different perspectives on what significant risk might entail than lawyers. And there's probably multiple contradictory bits of case law that push in both directions. I think the other reason people think breach disclosures are expensive is a lot of the commonly quoted numbers on the cost of a breach, you know, the $197 or $212 per record, include a substantial amount of estimated economic loss from the breach. So it's not an accounting cost. It's not a, we spent $100 on envelopes and $500 on getting PR to review the letter and then $5,000 on stamps and what have you. It's, we think that our customers are going to run away and so we have this estimate of how big a cost that's going to be. And I, I'm incredibly skeptical of those numbers about expected future costs. But they influence people's perception of what the cost of complying with the law is. And, and so I think the, the perception of expense is as big as the actual expense in inhibiting uh, doing the right thing. So on the uh, 
expense. One of the, actually, the, the quote that I highlighted in the book in my reread was, uh, perhaps it's okay to spend more on coffee. So but first we have to take that out of context. And I, I always believe it's okay to spend more on coffee. But uh, uh, in context, um, you're pointing out that you know a lot of people talk about whether or not you're spending enough on security without mm -hmm. without defining not only enough, but without defining the goals, without defining objectives, without defining what works and what doesn't, and what the objectives are, and and how that plays into the industry, and that that's where that back to the economics quote. Um, you know, one of the things that I like to say to start a, a conversation, or more likely argument, is every time a large company has a large breach, I like to uh, throw at some people who shall remain nameless except on Twitter. Um, well, obviously they spent too much on security because they got popped. And, you know, the, you, can, you can hear the sphincter slam shut, but it starts a conversation <laughs> with, uh, did, they, did they spend it in the wrong place? Uh, did they spend too much? Did they spend too little? I, I love it. Um, I'm, Coffee I'm going to relax your sphincter. <laughs> Thank you. No, I mean, the origin of that, uh, the, the thing we're responding to is somebody, somebody made the observation that companies spend more money on coffee than they do on, uh, on information security. And the implication was, what the heck is wrong with those people? Don't they know better? Well, you know, maybe they actually do know better. Um, and I, I love the comment that they spent too much or they spent money in the wrong place. I think it's it's spot on. And I think it goes to the, the difficulty of figuring out how to spend your money most effectively in something approximating an information vacuum. Yeah, but what do, what do people like quantify what security spending is is that firewalls or is that i put in a really kick-ass backup system so that if something gets compromised i can re-image it right away that that may not necessarily be security i mean that's it spending mm -hmm. and it's i think a lot of times it's difficult to differentiate mm -hmm. between security spending and it spending yeah, yeah. Great point. Um, you know, you, you got to say, here's a methodology, but then it gets expensive to collect data. You know, if company A ha includes their disaster recovery business continuity as security mm. and company B includes it in IT, recalculating that budgets to figure out, you know, okay, how much did we spend on security according to this definition so I can answer a question in a survey? I, I I hope you guys have better things to do with your time. <laughs> yeah, it's called disaster recovery and security. Right. right. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Jack, did you have more questions? We have about I, ten minutes left. I, I um, yeah. One of the things, one of the threads through uh, the book and you know the, the new school idea ideas um, sort of line up with what. Some people call the oper oper yeah, no, 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 oper operationalization of security, where you know instead of having these silos, why is why is IT not responsible for security? Why is not, you know, why is why does the network admin uh, not have insight into and responsibility for? And it's been uh, personally, it's been kind of interesting in the past several years, moving from uh, an extremely small business SMB focus where. Uh, not only did the security guy uh, perform network functions and the network guy did security functions, but when I was done with those, I took out the garbage at the end of the day. You know, um, it wasn't optional, but the more I deal with larger and larger enterprises, the more uh, I see this entrenchment of you know, little fiefdoms of uh, power and budget that... Uh, it seems to be inhibiting some some motion. And since you're you've dealt with some very large organizations and you're in one yourself, have you seen real prog real progress in the enterprise on uh, getting at least cooperation, if not uh, unification, of some of these functions? <laughs> um, and I, 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 uh, I, I could have asked I ten questions, but instead I asked one ten-minute question. <laughs> yeah, no, no, that, that's okay. And the, the, the reason I hesitate is actually Microsoft is the first big company I've worked for in 
I think it was about 10 years between the hospital that I worked at at the start of my career, which was also a large organization, and being here. Learned a lot of lessons along the way. Um, I see a lot of integration. I see a lot of cooperation. Um, I think operationalization, I think figuring out how to take these... How to take these security issues that are here and bring them to the people who are doing things that may lead you to insecurity. I think we've got some really interesting lessons at Microsoft. Um, one that I can speak to is the security development life cycle, how we work with our entire um, population of development engineers, all our organizations that are shipping code, making services available, and we integrate security in from requirements through design, through implementation, testing, release, deployment, and that's been that's been a huge, huge win. Uh, the the number of serious code bugs that go into the code um, that have security impact is smaller. Our ability to find them is better. Our ability to manage them and make sure we don't ship things with known issues is better. And I have a small, much smaller interaction with our um, operational guys and our IT guys, but I, I think the same approach works there. And I think a lot of security people are afraid of that a little bit because it's the, the work, it, it feels like you're giving away your job. You're saying, here, you do this, and then maybe you have to worry about what you're going to do or that the job isn't going to be done as well. And, you know, going back to these elevation of privilege cards, um, I think everyone on this call is going to, th or on this podcast, is better able to threat model than a random developer chosen out of all of the people who are writing PHP code out there in the world. But the truth is, those people writing PHP code weren't necessarily bringing in anyone to do any threat modeling at all. And so now we've got them doing some, and I think that's a win. And so I think that people worrying about operationalization of security yeah there's there's trade-offs there's concerns those are valid concerns um but look at the benefits look at what what else happens and say can i make the cost benefit here work for me and can i give myself a more interesting job by taking the parts of this that are routine and handing someone a tool that does it, handing someone a training class, making a change to a compiler so that, you know, it's just harder to compile in your buffer overflows. Um, I, I, think, I think that's getting security where it needs to be, and I don't really think it threatens... It's a, it's a change, change is scary, but I don't think it really threatens anyone's job to do it. Very good. Very cool. Um, you can, of course, buy Adam's book on Amazon.com, and you can even get it on your Kindle. Is that you, right? Is that right, Jack? Jack you can, yes. You can Jack get it on your Kindle. Kindle. That's why I had the no new handy. school of information security it's uh, by Adam Shostak and Andrew Stewart. Highly recommended. It's a <laughs> Thank you. quick, quick read, well documented. It's like where, what was that? And then the notes, I could actually find things, yeah. um, and it's. Uh, it is a couple of the a couple of the uh, references or stories are a little bit uh, out of the news, but sadly, there's a corresponding one that you probably saw on Twitter this week. So don't, don't worry about if you say that was years ago. Uh, just read today's news, and you'll see the same thing again. Unfortunately. <clears throat> Alrighty, well, you can find Adam's blog at emergentchaos.com. The links are in the show notes. Adam, thank you very much for appearing on Paul.com. Hey, thank you all. It was thank loads you. of fun. We should do it again sometime. Absolutely. 
Thanks, Adam. Alrighty. Have a good night. Take care. Take care. Bye-bye. And with that, we're going to take our first commercial break. And I'm not talking about, like, commercials from our sponsors. Maybe someday. Who knows? Mm -hmm. But Dave has actually figured out a way to get commercials in the live stream. So we're going to... Wow. Uh, are we ready for this, Dave? Oh, just sit back, relax, All right, and Dave, enjoy the ride. Sit back, relax. I don't need to do anything, and commercials are going to magically and, happen. And, and Jack's going to wipe off his, his chin from the Adam Shostak uh, <laughs> fanboyism. He's drooling a little bit. Yeah, yeah. The beard's a little damp. <laughs> and here we go. Here we go. Cut to commercial break. <laughs> 